if I asked you to make up a song right now, could you do it? <laughs> Absolutely not. No, couldn't do that at all. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Couch Surfing, the show where promising young guests look back at their big roles, their little roles, and everything in between. I'm here social distancing with Carrie Mulligan. Carrie, how's it going? It's good, thank you. How are you? I'm fantastic. Happy New Year. You ready to surf? Happy New Year. Yes, ready. All right, let's do it. Katie, what have I told you about listening at the door? <laughs> I haven't seen this in such a long time. You know, Carrie, what an auspicious beginning. I mean, is it true that a letter that you wrote to this screenwriter, Julian Fellows, landed you this gig? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, it. yeah, pretty much. <laughs> you know, I didn't know anyone who was an actor. I, you know, no one in my family, no one was even in any kind of anything related to the industry. And so he was the one person I'd ever met who was an actor. So I wrote him a letter and um, and he ended up introducing me to somebody who was the assistant to the casting director for this. And then I went and auditioned for, for this. And then, yeah, somehow miraculously got the job. Um, so it was just a, you know, kind of crazy twist of fate, really. All right. Up next. Oh, no. Okay, those so statues. crazy freaked me out how scary was the it statues are the statues are actually objectively terrifying okay yeah i was um <laughs> uh and and they had these amazing kind of performance artists who played the angels so they were behind these masks and and you know they really were like moving towards us um gosh that's so crazy i, I don't think i've i don't know if i've ever watched that carrie it doesn't get more british than doctor who did you feel like you'd really arrived when you landed this part I, I do. It was, it was funny because I remember thinking like, oh, God, I'm not going to be able to go on public transport now because I'm just because I've been on Doctor Who. <laughs> it just wasn't true at all. Um, but yeah, it was it was a big deal. And it was a big deal to, you know, to get to be a part of this like massive institution. And um, yeah, sort of, it, you know, it's so it's so a part of our culture here, Doctor Who. Like I grew up watching Doctor Who. So to be in it was crazy. Even now I get sort of letters and pictures of Sally Sparrow to sign and things like that, which is just so funny. If the opportunity presented itself again, would you revisit? I'd totally revisit Sally Sparrow. I don't know if I'd, yeah. I mean, it was, you know, it's so much fun. All right, up next. It was a terrible brummy accent in there. Oh, <laughs> Peter. Gosh, that's so weird. Anyway, that feels I'll like yesterday. I love you. this film. No, it's I one am. of my yeah. favorites. Uh, did you have a visceral reaction to the script? Did you instantly know that you had to be a part of this? It's funny because it sort of went through so many different iterations. It was, and I think even when I first kind of auditioned for it or read it, it was there was a different director attached, and then that director moved on, and and then Lone Sherfig came on, um, and it was sort of in my life for. About like 18 months. And at one point, I think they even were sort of like, well, you've outgrown Jenny now, so you maybe need to play um, the part that Rosamund Pike ended up playing. And then that was sort of thrown out the window. And then I went back in and auditioned for for Jenny. So it sort of moved, it was sort of around for so long. And then, you know, it was weird because I kind of got it, which was amazing and got to work with these incredible people. But it still felt like so small and indie and... And it was. Your eyes grew wistful when Peter appeared on the screen. What was he like to work with him? And did you resent the fact that you were getting soaked while he stayed dry in that scene? <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, no, I don't, I don't think I had a moment. I don't think I've ever had a moment of resentment in my whole career. I've just felt so sort of thrilled to be at work all the time. But I remember that day. Those, those things are so funny, especially on independent films, because your rain machine is usually like, like a, like someone pouring a sort of watering can over your head because they can't afford to have like the big. So I think it genuinely felt like someone sort of following me with a watering can as I walked down the street. And you can see, I think, in some of the shots, like there's no rain sort of to my left or to my right. Or, um, so I wasn't getting that wet. Welcome back to Couch Surfing. I'm still here with Carrie Mulligan. Carrie, shall we continue? Yes, let's do it. All right. Okay. That's so funny. I know that exact shot because that was the day after I got cast in The Great Gatsby. Really? 
Yeah. And I'd just flown back in from New York. You know, there's very little dialogue in this film, and it's very stylized. How did you go about shaping your character, Irene? It was a lot about the, t- the connection between the two of them. I think, you know, kind of like a classic fairy tale, like a dark fairy tale. Like she's sort of somewhat a princess stuck, stuck in the top of a tower and he's coming to her rescue. So we didn't really feel like it needed a huge amount of chat. Um, she was, you know, he was just somebody who was sort of could see her. And um, there was a bit more dialogue in the script and we sort of ended up just taking it out and lots of long longing stares at each other <laughs> seemed to do the trick well, well, um it's more yeah a, more of a haiku yeah exactly 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 all right up next it's up to oh. you oh sorry i can't say that oh man you have a beautiful voice did you enjoy getting to flex your vocal muscles yeah, I mean, it was so... I, I I grew up wanting to be a musical theatre actor. That was sort of my sort of dream. And that that was a terrifying ordeal, shooting it, because it was always clear in Steve's mind that he wanted it to be a single take and he didn't want to cut away, you know... Um, I think he cuts away once in the film to, to Michael, but it was always going to be sort of just on me for the whole thing, really close up. The camera was, like, in my face. Um, and you know, there was like an audience of people watching and there was a crew and, um, so it was definitely, yeah, nerve nerve wracking. And then at one point Steve said, um, can you just sing something else as well? And I said, what do you mean? He was like, well, you know, she's, she's not just going to sing one song. She has to be like finishing a set. And I was like, well, okay, well, what shall I sing? And he said, oh, I don't know. You've, you know, just make something up. And I was like, what? And he was like, and it can't be anything that we know because otherwise we'll need to get the rights for it. So just make something up. And I said, well, I don't, I don't know how to make something up. He was like, you're an artist, aren't you? So just make something up. And I was like, okay. Yeah, I made up like the last line of some sort of sad love song about like a dead rose or something. I don't know what it was. <laughs> all right, up next. Is all this made entirely for Please tell me that you got to keep this wardrobe. I think I took... Like a little bead fell off one of my dresses once and I kept it and I stuck it into a book. So I have that somewhere in my house. Wait, but, just um, a bead? No, I've got to keep nothing. <laughs> no. Like just a bead. I know. And I remember I remember on set Leo being like, oh, I'm taking the, you know, um, I'm going to take that painting and I'm going to take this. I'm going to take <laughs> I'm going to take all this. This is going to be my souvenir. And I was like, damn it. Leonardo DiCaprio can do whatever he likes. So where were you when you got the news that you'd landed the part? I was at a dinner um, and Catherine Martin was there. Um, the Baz's partner and br- pr- brilliant production designer and um, she was there Anna Winter was there I think Anna already knew um, I think she always knew everything before I did in terms of that job I think she Baz, Baz shared everything with her so she was already in the know and wait, so Catherine Anna, came Anna, over to me and- wait Anna Wintour editor-in-chief of Vogue magazine knew you'd landed the part before you knew you'd landed the part <laughs> Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. As I would expect, you know, um, it makes perfect sense. Up next. I just thought that you were drunk. <laughs> yeah. Really drunk. I yeah. absolutely well. love this film. It's such a I wonderful mashup of so many different genres. You get drama, yeah. psychological thriller, dark comedy. Is that what drew you mm. to this project? The fact that you could play with that many different tones yeah I mean I just hadn't read anything like it I just read it I remember just I think I was sort of standing up in my kitchen and uh I was I started reading it and then I like on my phone and I just sort of got to the and I just suddenly realized that I'd finished it because I just couldn't you know when you sort of get frozen in place and you're just sort of absorbed by something and then suddenly it was an hour later and I'd read the whole thing and I just hadn't read anything like it and I didn't know sort of necessarily what I was looking to do next um, because whatever I couldn't, there was no way of sort of describing it. I wanted it to be contemporary and I wanted it to be something that felt, you know, that was new. And then I read this and I thought, I've never read anything like this. And also, I can't believe she's letting me do this. I wanted to talk to you about the role of makeup in this film, because traditionally mm. in a film, a gal gets dolled up for her hot night out, out on the town. But in this film, Makeup functions sort of like a war paint. Yeah. We had a lot of conversations about makeup. We had an amazing makeup artist, Angie Wells, who I worked with on Mudbound. um, And she came to do the makeup on this. And 
a lot of what Cassie is doing is sort of hiding in plain sight. And I think, you know, Emerald's often talked about the fact that, you know, as a society, we tend to sort of trivialise things like makeup and things that girls like sort of pop music. And actually, there's so much validity to all of those things. Like we shouldn't, it shouldn't be silly to sort of like, you know, taking time doing a manicure. But part of what Cassie's doing is playing into that. You know, she's somebody who has a multicoloured manicure. Nobody's going to suspect you if you have a multicoloured manicure. No one's going to think that you have the capacity to sort of ruin their lives if you have that. And I think a lot of the choices around hair and makeup were, like, as you say, war paint, disguises, ways of sort of navigating the world without drawing attention in a way that she doesn't want. Um, So it was a lot of fun to figure those different characters out. Carrie, thank you so much for surfing by. Thank you. It was so fun. It was really, you were fantastic. And congratulations. Um, At Promising Young Woman is in theaters and on demand now. See you next time on Couch Surfing. Bye.